And so in the business world, that's what they're learning. That's what the wealthy people are doing. They're figuring out how to not take advantage of the tax code, but use the tax code to their advantage. And they are not buying things to avoid taxes, unnecessary things. They're buying things that create cash flow to help with taxes. And in the farming and ranching world, what are we doing? We're just buying things, depreciating things that cost us money to avoid taxes. And so wealthy people think about money differently. Hey, hey, I'm Shay and I'm your host for the Casual Cattle Conversations podcast, the beef producer's place to explore new ideas and management practices to improve their lifestyle and operation. Now, before we dive into today's episode, I want to let you know that I am now open for speaking gigs. So if you want me to lead a workshop, be on a panel or deliver a keynote at your next event, you can connect with me on my website, casualcattleconversations.com and just use the contact box and I'll get back to you. So with that, let's dive right in to today's episode. All right, Mary Jo. Well, it is great to have you on the podcast. I always enjoy having fellow podcasters on the show too. And we're going to be talking about the mindset around money because we talk a lot about management and how that relates to the cattle business on my show, but I haven't talked enough about the financial side of things. And I know you have some great insights and really work with a lot of producers. So I'm excited to hear your perspective today. But before we kind of dive into that, would you share a little bit about what you're doing within your business to help cattle operators? So I, if, if people don't know who I am that are listening to your podcast, I wrote the book, um, farming without the bank. And so, or ranching, whatever you want to call it, it depends where you're at in the country. Right. <laughs> and so <laughs> all I'm doing is what'd you say? I said, or the state. <laughs> yeah, exactly. That makes a difference as well. Um, and so I am just helping producers look at their finances and building their own system of money to borrow from and making the bank really plan B instead of plan A. It's not necessarily about getting rid of the bank. I don't hate the bankers. People, people think that's the, the whole concept as they read the title of the book, but it's really about just showing farmers and ranchers that they can take back control of their money without having the bank have control telling them when they can buy cattle, when they have to sell cattle, you know, what they have to feed, all that good stuff. So what would you say is like the biggest difference you see in farmers and ranchers once they take the liberty to make those changes and start making the bank plan B? Like, how are they operating different? How is their morale different? Like, what's the biggest difference that happens when they make that change? Mm -hmm. That's actually a really good question that nobody has ever asked me before. It is liberating. Like it's, it is so fun to get the emails that have said, Hey, you know what? I just bought cows today and I didn't have to go to the bank or the bank told me, no, I'm, I can't buy sheep. And I said, well, you know what to you. And I'm just going to go to my life insurance policy and borrow that money. Um, cause at the end of the day, what I teach is infinite banking and using whole life insurance. And so when we've built the system enough, we can do that. Even now in today's world, where we're at, at the moment of this recording is eight to 9% interest uh, or nine and a quarter, nine and a half, I think is the highest I've heard on operating. And, you know, it's been really, I've had a couple of clients say, oh, I've not had to use my cash value for operating. And I, now I'm going to, cause it was at 4%. So I was using the bank and now I get to go to my policy and I don't have to worry about it. I can, you know, use the bank as plan B and use my policy because it's cheaper interest and they get control of that money, control of the payback. And so it's super, like, it's just, you can just hear the relief in their voice. The stress level goes down. And once you have, once you start building your system of money and you start getting away from the bank, you pay closer attention to your numbers. You pay closer attention to just how money works because the problem is, is we're not taught how money works. And so a lot of people think, oh, I'm just selling some life insurance, right? 
it's a concept and a thought process around money and utilization of that money. We don't utilize our money that is most efficient for cash flow. And so once you once they read the book and it opens up their mind, like they don't look at that, they don't look at that cow at the same anymore. Like she might not just be some purebred in the herd. It's what kind of cash flow is she producing? Because at the end of the day, we need cash flow to be able to pay our bills. Absolutely. So you said it's a thought process. So what mindset changes do you have to kind of coach people through so that they can change that thought process? Depends how, depends where their thought process came from. Okay. So if they've always been told you can't make money farming, or you can't have that, or maybe I was a big Dave Ramsey fan and we can't buy that because we can't afford it. And so there's just a lot of things that I'm over here saying, really? you can't buy it instead of how can you buy it? Because we're not taught to think like that, right? We're not taught to say, okay, maybe we should go to the bank and, and maybe we shouldn't use our own cash value to borrow against. Um, another one is cash is not King in my world. Cash is queen because every time you buy something with cash, if you're going to buy a tractor with cash, unless it was the last couple of years, it was a depreciating asset. It was not creating any kind of cash flow or appreciation. Yes, you can tell me I needed it to feed cows. I get it. But at the end of the day, when you sell that tractor, it's not worth what you paid for it. And so all of those things, I'm questioning every belief you've ever had or been told. And it's really challenging. You know, I had a guy call me just today and he said, Mary Jo, I have a HELOC. Should I borrow money from my policy to pay off my HELOC? And a lot of guys are using their HELOCs, their home equity lines of credit. They're using those as operating. Well, his was 10, he's at 10 and a half percent or something like that. I'm like, yeah, your policy is four. Yes, borrow from your policy, pay off the HELOC and then pay your policy back for what you were doing but we just got to control that. So it's a, it takes time to make those, those mindset shifts because we're programmed from birth. You pay cash or you borrow money. That's, those are your only two options. There's nothing else out there. We're not taught to create cash flow. We're just taught to just do what everybody else does and never question how wealthy people get wealthy. You know, like if we have a really if we have a rancher that's really successful, why? What did he do to get there? And a lot of us in our mindset will say, well, he screwed somebody along the way. We don't like him. We can't like him because he's wealthy. Is he? I mean, some people do, right? <laughs> not everybody's a good person, <laughs> but not everybody's a bad person either. And so what did they do to become successful that maybe we're not doing? And a lot of times our jealousy kills the curiosity of even asking what they did. So immediately we go to the negative spot. And so it's just like, it seems like it's, it's not just one or two things that I'm kind of breaking down. It's everything sometimes. So you brought up the point, you know, what do wealthy people do to get wealthy? And as you were learning those concepts, were you looking at just like beef farmers and ranchers who are successful? Or did you look at outside industries as well and see how all those business concepts can relate back? Because in my opinion, sometimes as ag producers, we try to segregate ourselves and forget that all business is business. Mm -hmm. That hundred percent, you are hundred percent, right? All business is business. At the end of the day, your farm and your ranch is a business and you need to run it like a business because uh, if I we're in business. And if you're in business and you're losing money, people from the outside go, well, geez, you're a terrible business owner. If Ace Hardware is losing money, well, they're a terrible business owner. How can they be losing money? Right? Well, how can you be losing money as a farmer and a rancher? You shouldn't be losing money either. Oh, well, we have market volatility. You do have market volatility, hundred percent, 100% agree. 
But we also know history shows markets of cattle go up and down. And so right now, cattle are high. I have had clients who, when cattle were high back in uh, 13, I believe it was, when cattle were high, they sold their entire herd, got rid of them. And then they came back in and did a feedlot. And when the feedlot business was at its high, they got rid of that and cattle were out there low, you know, cow calf pairs, and they got back in because they're running a business. They didn't get emotionally attached to those cows and, and that herd. And they're doing where the, they're doing what the money is showing works. And so I'm not looking at just farming and ranching. I'm looking at real estate. I'm looking at every other business, blue collar businesses. I have people that do everything, um, everything. Like so, some things I'm like, that makes money. That's crazy. Like I absolutely love my job because the craziest things ever that you would never think of people are doing. But at the end of the day, it's all about numbers. It's all about profit and loss. It's all it comes down to. So what would you say to like, so one thing, so I'm a young producer, been out of college for a year. And one thing that was really brought to light while I was in college and taking some of those courses was that, well, it's really tough just to make it with just a farmer ranch. Like you need someone or some sort of outside income with that. So what advice do you have for people who want to step away from needing that outside income? Like what can they look at? What can they think about to see if the resources they have, the operation they have can be sustainable and provide the income they want as a business? Oh, that drives me crazy when I hear that. <laughs> yeah. Sometimes you do need the off the farm income to get things going. I love it when my young producers have off the farm income, we can build that banking system. We can have that money, right? Like we can hoard the money and really get ourselves going. But at the same time, do we have to own the land and the cattle? I talked to a guy this week, 52 years old. He's never owned his cows. He's never owned any cows and he's never owned any land. He rents the ground and he runs yearly. Custom grazes. Talk to several of those people over the last 13 years. The amount of money they are making is insane. You don't have to own the ground. And young people, this is what I see. Young people want to go out and they want to run to FSA and get their loan on land. And then they want to run to FSA and get that cattle note. If I see anybody fail quickly with numbers, it's when we have a land note and a cattle note at the same time. We don't have to have either. We don't have to have both. We don't have to go buy every piece of equipment. We can barter. We can lease it. We can rent it from a neighbor, right? We don't, we can build slowly. We don't have to jump all in and have everything at once. Typically, and I don't care what age you are. This isn't an age thing. It's a human nature thing. When we start farming, we want everything all at once. So we can say that we farm. Well, if we're far, if we're starting a ranch, is there something else we can do on the ranch to make money? Agritourism is massive right now. Do you want to do agritourism? I have people that have you pick gardens. They have you pick flower farms. They're doing pumpkin patches. They're bagging their you know, they might have a little piece of ground, like maybe 40 acres or something. Instead of selling that corn, they're bagging it. And then they're selling the bags to people feeding squirrels and deer, you know, and they're making more money than what they would have got if they hauled it into the elevator. We just have to be super creative with what we're doing and look outside of what's normal because if you want to stay on the farm all day and you don't want to punch a clock, what else can that farm do to produce income that can replace the income of what you're doing eight to five? Right. I don't care if it's growing microgreens. I really like the amount of things you can do is insane. It's just that we don't, we don't think about it. Because someone in our family is going to say, well, Shay, you have lost your ever loving mind. You're going to grow microgreens? What? That's not going to work. 
okay, tell the guy that that's growing microgreens making $20,000 a month in their basement. Tell them that, right? Tell the lady that that's doing a flower garden because, or a flower farm, sorry, because her husband has, they have some cattle and they have this extra acreage and she's selling flowers at the farmer's market or she's selling flowers to the flower shop. Tell them that it doesn't work. It's small thinking that keeps us in that process. And it's sad. It's sad. And it makes me angry that your college professors told you that. <laughs> makes me mad. <laughs> Not it, okay. I mean, it's, but like, that's a mindset and that's, you know, maybe something they were told and it maybe wasn't directly said, but that was a lot of the conversation mm -hmm. and it's, but like you said, you have to think outside the box and we get caught up in this. Well, what will my other family members think? You know, if I do start a you pick flower garden or growing microgreens or doing something like that. And I also think yeah. in my mind, those things don't have to be permanent either, but they right. can have a place to get us where we want to be. That's no different than picking up a side hustle to get another business where you want to be. I mean, sometimes I take on social media clients on the side. If I need other income, that's not my main thing, but it gets me where I want to be with my own business. Mm -hmm. Yeah. hundred percent. Why not? This is, this is the thing that I see. Hey folks, it's Shay here. And I want to personally invite you as my listener to take the next steps in improving the profitability of your operation by signing up for my 2023 Rancher Mind series. The Rancher Mind program consists of producer driven monthly calls that cover topics such as developing a reproduction program, labor challenges, cattle marketing, business development, and goal setting. I bring on industry experts each month to answer your specific questions. I also provide extra resources and a place for you to keep networking and moving forward without requiring you to leave the ranch. For more information, head over to my website, casualcattleconversations.com, and select the Rancher Mind event tab. Let's keep moving individual operations and our industry forward. If you listen to my podcast or any of my social media, you know that millennials are like my favorite people on earth. And it is because millennials are not scared to do new things. They're not scared to take risk. And they surely do not listen to the older generation that's negative, which is fantastic because me as a Gen X, I still, that, that I always listened. I mean, I didn't always follow instruction and I'm more of a risk taker, but I don't have the arrival syndrome. Every new little thing out there makes me excited, like everything. And so I want to start every business I hear about because I am okay taking that risk knowing eh, if it didn't work, what's worst case scenario that somebody says, oh my gosh, Mary Jo, how many businesses do you have to start? I'm like, well, maybe I started five, but how many did you start? None. You didn't even take the risk. So mm -hmm. kudos to you, I guess. If you're never going to take that risk, then you don't have the ability to open your mouth and tell somebody else not to take the risk, right? If you've taken the risk and you've learned from it, it's like somebody saying, well, you know what? I can't do, re I'm not doing regenerative agriculture because the neighbor did it and it didn't work. Okay. But did the neighbor do it right? Did they go to all the classes? Did they learn everything that they needed to do? No, you can have two guys doing traditional ranching right beside each other, running cows exactly the same and one's going to be different than the other because of their practices. But it's the same ground. Why is one cow gaining more weight than the neighbor who is not? It's because they're doing something different, right? And we don't, in the egg world, we don't, we stick up for one another and we're there to help in a time of tragedy, right? But when there's no tragedy, we are eating each other alive. And we are telling each other they're doing everything wrong and that you can't do this and you're stupid for doing that. When in fact, just let me run my operation the way I want to run it. And if I fail, guess what? You have an opportunity to buy some land because I'm probably going to go bankrupt. So, but why are you sitting there judging me? Why can't we all just be okay with that and help one another out and talk to one another and share what we're doing? Because there's a huge disconnect from the, farming and ranching world to the business world. 
And in the business world, my colleagues and I will we'll all get together and talk about what we're doing and how we're helping people. And I mean, I'm helping them write books about the same concept. Mm -hmm. Nelson helped me, right? It's an abundance mindset. And in the farming world, we have a scarcity mindset until somebody is sick and they need help. And we're all over there. A tragedy happens during branding. Guess what? Every neighbor is going to show up. But that doesn't happen when, well, what are you doing to help your cows gain weight faster? What are you doing? Cause you got more money from JBS when they bought out or when, you know, feedlots, they don't talk to one another and they live on the same road. Why, why aren't, why aren't we doing that? Do you think that farmers and ranchers have gotten into this mindset where they're almost scared to be wealthy and talk about money where they don't even strive for it? Mm -hmm. Yep. hundred percent. They feel guilty. And I'm a, this is a hot topic for me too. They feel guilty because society over the years have made them believe that they should not have money. So think about it. Cattle prices are high. Some of these guys are going to go to town. They're going to get a new pickup. Could be the first new pickup they ever had in their life, right? Could be the new first new pickup they've had in 15 years. And somebody's going to say, must be nice to be a rancher. You guys can drive those new pickups. And the rancher is going to say, he's going to be all mad, right? He's going to say, well, you know how many hours I've put in? I haven't gotten a new pickup my whole life, or I haven't gotten a new pickup in 10 years. And they're going to come on the defense. When somebody says to you, oh, it must be nice. You say it is nice. Would you like to have a new pickup too? I bet you go to the sale barn and buy yourself some cows and you can go down to the local auction or local land man and you could probably find some land to buy and you could start your own ranch. It's pretty awesome. You should try it, right? Some old guy told me one time, I don't like life insurance agents. They make too much money. I've never made money in my life raising cattle. And these guys, they make all kinds of money. And I said, oh, I said, why didn't you go get your life insurance license then? and sell life insurance. Well, I, I, I was farming. And I said, well, then you should have quit farming and went to get your life insurance license if you wanted to make more money. <laughs> he had nothing to say, nothing. And now this, this guy was in his eighties and I should be respectful of my elders, but I am a little bit, you know, feisty. I'm a little bit ornery. And so I'm like, no, it's not okay. And we think that we should be broke we wear a badge of honor that it's okay or we shouldn't make money. And that's why we should all be making money. We should all be proud of the fact that we're making money because we're running a business. Make the money, spend it. I don't care if you flaunt it. I don't care if you give it away. Be proud of your new vehicle. Be proud of the purebred herd that you bought. Be proud of the bull that you bought. I don't care that you spent... $7,000 on that bull you've always wanted with the genetics you've always wanted. Buy it and be thankful that you could. Right? I just don't apologize for it anymore. And neither should any farmer or rancher out there. Well, farmers and ranchers do work hard. So mm -hmm. they shouldn't have to apologize for... Right when they do have money, neither should anyone. I mean, ultimately we decide what type of lifestyle we want to live. And if we're okay with having less money and want to be more minimalistic, then that's fine. That's a personal choice, but we should, I don't think anyone should ever feel guilty for how much wealth they can create because ultimately wealth can do a lot of amazing things for not only ourselves, but our communities and mm -hmm. others. And you should never have to be defensive about how much money you make. No, I, so if you, if you could change and like wave a magic wand, Mary Jo's magic wand, what is the one thing you would change about beef producers as they relate to finances, managing money, whatever it may be? What would your magic wand change if it was a reality? Mine would be the mindset that you're running a business, that your cattle are not your babies. I get that we have genetics. I came from a purebred operation. If anybody gets genetics, I understand that whole purebred thing. 
But at the end of the day, it comes down to cash flow. And so change your mindset that that business needs to produce cash flow. And if that means that you have to make a change, who cares what the neighbors are going to say? Because the neighbors are probably hurting financially as well. And we got to pay our bills. So you brought up earlier before we went down this rabbit hole about, you know, what do wealthy people do to get wealthy? So what are some of those things that wealthy people do to get wealthy that farmers and ranchers can replicate in their own businesses? A lot of it is a lot of it. I'm going to think about that for a sec, because I really think a lot of it comes down to mindset. It comes down to connections. A lot of people in the business world have business coaches, right? Like I've, I have people that I will either pay to be a business coach for me or colleagues that I will go to, but we are all working together for the betterment. That's not happening in this industry. We are going to conferences and we're learning about, oh, what feed should we have? What extra nutrition should we be giving those cattle, right? What vaccines do they need? How can we save the extra dollar there? But we're not learning about the money side of it. And so in the business world, that's what they're learning. That's what the wealthy people are doing. They're figuring out how to not take advantage of the tax code, but use the tax code to their advantage. And they are not buying things to avoid taxes, unnecessary things. They're buying things that create cash flow to help with taxes. And in the farming and ranching world, what are we doing? We're just buying things, depreciating things that cost us money to avoid taxes. And so wealthy people think about money differently. Wealthy people utilize money differently. I mean, when I, <clears throat> I talked to about, I looked um, a couple of weeks ago, I've just kind of looked back. I've talked to about a thousand farmers a year, one-on-one. -on -one, okay. I look at all those numbers. I see all those numbers. So a lot of people will come in and be like, you don't have a clue what you're talking about. I can see who's making money and the people that know their profits and their losses and they break them all out and they're doing some sort of ranching for profit type enterprise system. I don't care if you go to ranching for profit or not, but if you're breaking out those enterprises and looking at those costs, that is you're running a business business. People in the real world run a business. So hang out, hang out with those people. Wealthy people love to tell you what they're doing. They very few will say, forget it. I'm not telling you, except, I mean, in the farming world, they might, um, and in the ranching world, they might, but they're in the business world. They're probably not. It's a management of people. How are you managing your people? How are you running your family operation and managing the people? As Jolene Brown would say, are we constantly at each other's throats wanting to kill each other? Are we telling the kids that they can't come back? That doesn't happen in the business world. They bring them in, they teach them, they pass it off in most cases. It's, it, it's so different and we think that it should be different. And in fact, it's not. It should be the same. I agree. I mean, if I wouldn't, you talk about business coaching, if I wouldn't have invested in that, year and a half, two years ago, I would not have been able to come home and have my podcast and my rancher minds as a source of income. It wouldn't, it would not be in the same place, but having that outside perspective and reaching out to other people and my peers, that's what keeps me going. And I, yeah, it's, it's almost like we try and keep everything a secret, yeah. even though I will say, beef producers can be very helpful. I know some who are very open, some are, who are very helpful, but those are the ones who, when you look at them, their operations are businesses. Mm -hmm. so they do have that mindset, like you said. Mm -hmm. But they're willing to help because they're wealthy, right? Wealthy people love to share what they're doing. What they don't like to do is share what they're doing with negative people that say, oh, well, I can't do that. I mean, I have clients call me all the time that we don't even talk about infinite banking. We don't talk about farming without the bank. 
they're saying, Hey, Mary Jo, do you know somebody that does this? Or do you have a contact with somebody that does this? Because I would like to talk to them. And most of the time, my clients are more than happy to talk to each other and share their experiences. Oh, we're doing direct to consumer. We're doing cut flowers. We're doing pumpkin patches, whatever. They're more than happy to talk to one another and help each other out and answer those questions and see if it works for them. But if you want to shut a wealthy person down, like if, if somebody asked me, oh, Mary Jo, how do I do what you do? And then I tell them everything and they go, oh, but I can't do that. My head wants to explode, Shay, because I'm like, what do you mean you can't do it? You can't do it because you think you can't do it, right? It literally comes down to what you think. So there you go. Well, I guess you're not going to do it then. And I just wasted my time. And so if you do have somebody wealthy that's standoffish, it's probably because they have been, they're just so tired of people asking for advice, but not ever taking it and doing anything with it. Cause sometimes I'm like, don't, don't even approach me. Like I'm done. I'm checked out. I cannot answer one more question from somebody that's not going to actually do what I suggest, or at least research it and try it mm -hmm. because I'm not going to give you advice that doesn't work, but it's never going to work if you don't do it. Absolutely. Well, there's risk in trying something and there's also risk in not trying something and which would you rather live with? Exactly. Yep. So what would you say, or what do you say to maybe those ranchers or farmers out there who feel just buried in debt and financial stress and they want to make a change, but it just seems so overwhelming to even think about what do you do next? Mm -hmm. Where, where are the little changes that can happen? Do we, I've talked to some that are just, they can't make payments. They're on the verge of losing stuff. Right. And it's really ironic that at that point, is it what's keeping us there? Is it emotions? Is it pride that is coming back in to the finances? So I've had many clients who have a lot of debt. And I'm like, how much machinery do you have sitting around that you don't use? I had one guy tell me he had a stock trailer. I said, what do you have a stock trailer for? You don't even have cows. Well, I might get them. I said, you have a stock trailer for cows you might buy, but you have all this debt and you have this stock trailer sitting outside rusting. It's not going to be worth anything. Why would you not sell it? and then buy a stock trailer when and if you get the cows. If we are on the verge of losing stuff, if we are on the verge of thinking, you know what, this doesn't work. Can we, do we sell all the cows and start over and start small and research? Maybe we do some regenerative stuff. Maybe we figure out how to run um, yearlings for somebody and do some custom grazing. If we have the land and we can't make the land payment and the cattle payment, do we get rid of the cattle? Right. That's what I call eating your pride because the neighbors are going to talk. And I have some friends that did this and the neighbors are still talking two years later. Oh, they went bankrupt. No, they tried to avoid going any further into debt. They were not bankruptcy, but they looked at their numbers and it wasn't working. And so there's a great number of people I talk to that go to ranching for profit and they come back and they sell their entire herd. That takes some guts. Like that is not for the meek and mild. The emotions of all of that is, can we start small? Where do we start small? And can we be okay that we're not, a, first of all, you're not a failure. If you do any of those things, you are not a failure. So many people think, well, if I had to sell out or if I had to sell equipment, I'm a failure. No, you're not. Because you had the guts to do it, right? Like that is not easy. Give yourself a pat on the back for doing that. And making yourself better, it might take you three, four years, but you're going to, in 10, 15, 20 years from now, 
the lesson you learned and where you're going to be is astronomically different than if you keep doing what you're doing. That's just going to keep you where you're at. So as we kind of wrap up today, where can any farmer or rancher start to change their mindset? Because that's what this was ultimately about was that it comes down to our mindset. And like you said, understanding that it's a business, we're not failures. If something that if we do have to change something and it's okay to do something different. So where does that mindset change start? For me, shut off the radio. Stop listening to talk radio. Stop listening to the news. <laughs> <laughs> we think everything is going to be doomsday. So be aware of what's going on, but do we have to listen to it all day long, right? In my book, it's about mindset. In Nelson's book, my mentor, it's about mindset. Start reading stuff that's about mindset. Start feeding your brain with podcasts, with information. Like I don't care if it's self-help, abundance versus scarcity. Read as many books, get as many books on audio as you can about abundance on podcasts. Those things are huge and they're free, right? Podcasts don't cost you anything. There are so many good ones out there. You know, my friend Jason has, um, Oh, I can't believe I forgot it. Uh, what's his podcast? It's all for farmers and ranchers as well. Egg state of mind. Oh yeah. Jason's yeah. been on the show before as a guest. Oh, okay. Yeah. Well, good. Go listen to him. He's amazing. Right? Like those yeah, he talked about comparison syndrome actually, but she ties <laughs> into kind of what we talked about today. <laughs> Jason is amazing. Like there are, and there's not a lot of guys willing to talk about their feelings and talk about all those things. Farmer on fire is a new one. I found that's been pretty good too. Oh, I will have to listen to that. Yeah. That one, it, it talks about mindset a lot too, as well. It, and it's, it is, it's everywhere, right? The, a lot of people think, oh, Mary Jo, you must spend all your time listening to infinite banking stuff and life insurance and money stuff. And mm, no, no, I spend a lot of my time on me because I have to grow mentally and, and emotionally in order to be able to provide for clients. Believe me, the abundance mindset did not come natural to me. I did not grow up with both parents being this abundance mindset. My dad is somewhat abundance, but he's willing to take the risk. He's a positive thinker. And yeah, that'll work. That'll work. And my mom is not. And so I have both of those tendencies, but I have learned that I don't need to tell my kids, oh, you can't do that. And so I had to get that from the outside world and all the books I read, you know, it's just a lot of people think it's woo woo. And so I don't, oh, I'm not going to listen to that. Mary Jo, there's reality. Shay, there's reality. Yeah. The reality of it is you're a negative thinker. And mm -hmm. so feed it with positivity. Start your day with positivity. If something's bad is happening, I've come to the, if I like, if anything bad happens, I'm like, Ooh, what is God teaching me in this moment? Like there is a lesson here. And what is the lesson? Like everything to me is a lesson or a teaching. And I, it, it's just, now it somewhat comes natural to spin that, but I would start with anything Just shut, even just shutting off the news will make you a happier person. Well, Mary Jo, thank you very much for sharing your knowledge and insight and um, personal experiences today in this podcast episode. It was great to visit with you. Thanks for having me. I appreciate it. And that's a wrap on that one, folks. Thank you for tuning in today and joining in on the conversation. Be sure to take this a step further and take the advice you learned and implement it on your operation. If you want to have a conversation about it, head over to my social media and send me a DM by following at Cattle Convos and connecting with me there. Have a great day.